you talk to people about mining in the West, they imagine a single individual with a rucksack on one shoulder and a pickaxe on the other, and they're gold miners, they're silver miners, they came out in one of the gold rushes, they go off into the mountains and they find a bonanza, they become instant millionaires. Well, I think when people have an idea of mining in the West, they're generally thinking about sort of hardy men and women coming out and looking for a better life. In reality, most miners in Colorado were working in coal mines. It's dirty work, it's dangerous work, it's not glamorous work, they're working in big teams. A miner would go in, the miner would begin by drilling holes in the coal, and then he would load dynamite in the holes, and then he would shoot the coal, then break it up, and then he would go in there, load the coal into his coal car, and that's how he got paid. So sometimes miners would bring home paychecks that were literally cents for working an entire week in the coal mine. And families lived in company housing, they shopped in company stores, they worshipped in company churches, their kids went to schools created by the company. So for all intents and purposes, life in coal camps was dominated by Colorado Fuel and Iron and other coal companies in Southern Colorado. In Las Animas and Huerfano counties, for more than 10 years, the coal companies have owned every official in both counties. The administration of law has been a farce. Congressman Keating on a visit to Southern Colorado. A lot of the mines in the area didn't pay miners with U.S. currency. They paid them with basically a scrip or, for no better term, a coupon that they would use to purchase items at the company store. The majority of people um, in the coal mines were from places like Italy, Greece, Yugoslavia. There's people that said that there was uh, as many as 23 different languages spoken at Ludlow, so it was a diverse community. They were promised a good life when they came here, but as they came here, they found that they were getting a bad treatment as far as their working conditions. The coal companies were ingenious in placing men in work groups together that didn't speak the same language and had historic animosities that they brought with them from the old country because they didn't want them talking. They didn't want them organizing and they didn't want them joining a union. Miners from different backgrounds speaking different languages, they realized over time that they had more in common than their differences. And little by little they began to organize. Mm -hmm. Then on September 23rd, they struck the coal mines. So the decision to strike was a family decision. No man would have decided to go on strike without consulting his wife because the family is making the sacrifice. The women were very involved in the strike. They were involved at all levels. It was actually the women that were more pro-strikers than, than some of their husbands were. If their husband had got hurt or died, you know, if they didn't have any means of supporting themselves in the coal camp, they were evicted. They knew the sacrifice of the strike. They knew that they were willing to risk everything to get better living and working conditions. Women were equal to men in making that decision. They set up tent colonies. One of the biggest ones was Ludlow. There were communities in the coal camps, but they tended to be sort of ethnically segregated, and there were some ethnic groups that did not like other ethnic groups. However, when you get to the strikers' tent colony, the people will talk about the time as sort of a very peaceful, happy time where people got along. The larger enemy of the corporation quieted a lot of that ethnic tension. Louis Ticus was one of the union organizers that was in charge of the tent colony. He was incredibly articulate, well-read. He, he was a person who brought together different nationalities, people from different backgrounds, uh, and he was excellent at it. 
So tensions have been building for days and weeks. There are things that are happening on both sides. There are violence breaking out. Shots are being fired. And strikers and National Guardsmen actually describe this sort of feeling that was building, that literally it was a powder keg about to explode. Colorado National Guard had come in early on um, in the beginning part of the strike, but the cost of, of keeping the National Guard members down there started to bankrupt the state, and so the governor had started pulling some of the Guard out, and it sort of devolved into some National Guard, some sort of local militia and hired gun type people, and Linderfeld was sort of in charge of those people. He rages violently upon little or no provocation, and is wholly an unfit man to bear arms and command men, as he has no control over himself. We have reason to believe that it is his deliberate purpose to provoke the strikers to bloodshed. Signed by all the committee. Sometime in the early morning hours of April 20th, 1914, shots were fired. No one can say where they came from or who fired the first shot. Louis Ticus with a white flag tried to approach the leaders of the National Guard to, to try to get them to stop shooting and it ended up costing him his life. They busted a rifle over his head and then uh, shot it three times. And he lay dead there on the railroad tracks. They murdered him to send a signal to the other miners that their lives were valueless. The uh, militia came through and somehow the tent colony started on fire. No, I didn't see them put the kerosene on the tent, but I saw the blaze. And I said that I've already put the children down in the well. It was a vacant well. It was gone dry, and I put all the children, there was about 24 or 25 of them, and I put them down one by one. And the women got their mothers and got them and laid them down. They were safer there from the bullets. There were four women and 12 children who had hid in a uh, cellar. And when the tent above them caught on fire, all of the children and two of the women uh, were suffocated and killed. The fact that the women and children were killed really outraged, first of all, the mining community and the strikers. So when they heard about it, they took up arms. They ran the state militia out of the two counties. They burned some of the coal mines down. They killed some of the company guards. And like I said, it was, it was warfare. So they head off into the hills, and, and they take shots and take aim at anyone they think is involved with CFNI or represents their interests. And so the war wages on. And upwards of 75 people total perhaps perished in the massacre and the war that resulted. And it was only when the president ordered federal troops into Colorado, May 1st, 1914, that the violence was quelled. The strike was called off with no resolution. Those that could would go back to work, but many of those men were blackballed as union members and they had to move on. The toll it took on the families is incredible. Even though they did not win the strike, they won numerous changes. They stopped paying them in script. There was better uh, safety. It eventually led to uh, the passage of the Wagner Act, which gave workers in this country the right to unionize. The takeaway from Ludlow would be that there's a human cost to this type of management system which exploited its workers. People need to be valued as human beings and not just for what they produce. And I think Ludlow is a constant reminder that we need to do better. I stand on their shoulders, uh, not only as a miner, but as a worker, because they, uh, they set a good table for me and I think I owe them the world. It was early springtime when the strike was on They drove us miners out the door Out from the houses that the company owned 
We moved tents and old Lolo. It was early springtime when the strike was on. They drove us miners out the door. Out from the houses that the company owned. We moved into tents at old Ludlow. We moved into tents at old Ludlow.